Welcome, everyone. My name is Dakai Hu, and I'm part of the MathWorks application engineering team. My job at the MathWorks mostly focuses on supporting motor and power control engineers in the automotive industry to adopt model-based design. In this video, I'm going to show you some industry examples for motor control design using MATLAB and Simulink. Motor control is a very important topic for transportation electrification. Typically, in electric or hybrid electric vehicles, the motor drive system consists of three parts, motors, power electronics, and the controls. As of now, 2018, the majority of vehicle traction motors are permanent magnet synchronous machines, or PMSM, because of their high efficiency and power density, as well as the ability to maintain constant power over a wide range of speed. On the other hand, we're also seeing an increasing presence of induction machines and switch reluctance machines as traction motors, each having their own unique advantages. In this video, we will focus on the control of PMSM, but some of the tools and techniques discussed here are applicable to other types of machines as well. The major control topics for PMSM I'm going to cover throughout this video include field-oriented control, auto-tuning PI controller gains, dynamic decoupling control, and flux weakening control. The general approach I'm going to use in this video is uh, that first I will introduce the concept, and then I'll walk you through a Simulink model that demonstrates the concept so you will get a concrete understanding of uh, how these concepts are implemented in industry. To begin with, we are going to look at the most fundamental concept in PMSM control, which is field-oriented control, or FOC. Engineers designing controllers for PMSM motors uh, usually rely on FOC control to provide the basic controller structure so that they can uh, decouple the control of flux and torque. Here you can see a schematic of the FOC control system. The core pieces of uh, this FOC controller are the park clock transform, uh, current controller, and also the uh, inverse park transform. Let's see how this is implemented in Simulink. I have model one opened up here. Here model one is the system level model for implementing FOC control for PMSM. I have partitioned the controller model to the left side and uh, the plant model to the right side. When you step into the plant model, you will notice a permanent magnet synchronous machine model that's part of Simscape's power systems library. You can access that library from here. So there's a library button you can click, and uh, that machine model is inside Simscape, uh, inside the power systems library, and under specialized technology, under fundamental blocks, under the machines. And this is the model that we used, this permanent magnet synchronous machine model. Okay, so you can just drag and drop here. Once you open the model, you'll notice that uh, you can initialize uh, the parameters in here in this panel. You can either uh, directly type in the values, or in my case, uh, if you look inside this model, I actually used uh, the parameters here and then initialized them in my MATLAB script. One thing I want to mention is that uh, when you select the mechanical input for this machine model, you can either select a speed input or a torque input. So when you select a torque input, basically you're saying that I want uh, the TM as my load torque. When you select a speed input, uh, this is similar to basically controlling the machine on a dyno um, and uh, controlling the speed of the machine using the speed source. So in my case, I'm using the speed as the mechanical input. I'm basically telling uh, the machine to constantly operate at 1,000 RPM while I'm tuning all those controller gains. So let's delete this guy. And uh, like I mentioned, I have a script to initialize uh, the parameters here. So if I pull up uh, model one initialization script, here you can see, let me zoom in a little bit. So here I've got a set of machine parameters. Uh, so I have the DQ axis uh, inductance as well as uh, the winding resistance and lambda M, which is the permanent magnet uh, flux linkage and also the pole pair number. 
And besides the machine parameters, I've also um, have in here um, initial set of controller parameters. So here I set uh, the controller gains for my PI controller to be one, and uh, I've set uh, 100 and negative 50 for my Q and uh, DX's current reference. So the set of PMS and parameters that I used here are actually comparable to the first generation Prius motor. Now let me just press the run button and run this script. After running the script, you will notice that all the parameters are popping up in the uh, workspace. Okay, let's go back to the model. So on the plant model side, you also notice that uh, we can access the motor measurements through this M port, uh, which includes you know, stator current ABC, which is currents on the stationary reference frame, uh, also the DQ currents, uh, as well as the rotor mechanical speed, omega M, and uh, the rotor mechanical angle, theta. And then if we go back to the top level model, you will see that uh, on the top level model, there's a unit delay block inserted in the feedback loop. This is necessary because of two reasons. First, for digital control, there's always going to be uh, some kind of delay in the sampling loop. Adding a delay here actually is true to the real system. Second, this unit delay block will help break any algebraic loop should they exist in this closed loop control system. Then on the controller side, you can see inside here, um, there are two PI controllers that are used to control ID and IQ and therefore to effectively control flux and torque. And then downstream, we have uh, inverse park and clock transform to compute alpha, beta, and ABC voltage commands. Further downstream, space vector PWM modulation algorithm and uh, also inverter models are often used to transform the voltage commands into PWM signals that are applied to the stator windings. But in our case, we wanted to focus on control algorithm development, not on the PWM switching or modulation techniques. And therefore, we are using ideal voltage source uh, in the model, as you can see in here. Okay, now from here, if we go back to the top level model, and let's press the run button here, and to start the simulation. The first thing you'll notice once you start running the model is that uh, all the simulink blocks will have uh, distinct colors. These colors actually indicates the sampling rate that each block is sampled at. And you can turn on the color legend from over here. And then turn on the colors. And then we'll see from this legend that uh, the red block, which is the controller block here, is sampled uh, at 100 microseconds. After simulation is finished, uh, you want to check if the current is following the command. So let's look at this scope. Here I'm looking at IQ current reference and response. It looks like there's uh, some overshoot and uh, the current is not reaching steady state within 0.3 seconds simulation time. Keep in mind that when we initialized the controller parameters, we used uh, one as the default gain for both the proportional and integral gain. And obviously that gain is not optimal and we need to tune those gains to achieve better performance. In industry, engineers will use a simulation to calculate the ballparks of those gains and then fine tune them during actual hardware testing. As a matter of fact, the controller gains are usually not fixed in the real case. Instead, they're scheduled based on different operating points. Uh, this is what we call gain scheduling. But that concept is beyond what we are discussing in this video. Okay, now back to how to auto-tune the PI controller gains within Simulink. Here I'm introducing you to a new tool called Simulink Design Optimization which can help you tune those gains automatically. Simulink Design Optimization is an add-on Simulink toolbox that allows engineers to analyze and tune model parameters and controller gains. To start Simulink Design Optimization, go to Analysis, Response Optimization, 
from here select new and step response envelope. The reason we are selecting this is because in our case, we wanted to specify a time domain step response requirements. This is where we should set up the time domain requirements. Remember in our initialization file, we set up IQ command to be uh, 100. So we're gonna use 100 here. Our entire simulation time is 0.3 seconds. So here I want the rise time to be 0.1 second and the percent rise to be 90%. And I want the settling time to be 0.2 seconds. And settling is 0.5%. Uh, For overshoot, I uh, wanted to use 1% uh, and undershoot also 1%. Here we also need to select the signals to bound. And in this case, IQ is the signal that we control to have a step response. So we have to go to the model and actually highlight the IQ feedback. Then we go back and go over here. And now you see that it's available in here for you to select. Click OK and OK. Now you will see this bounded envelope. And this is where we want to see uh, the IQ signal to converge into. And then we also need to select the design variable set over here. And in this case, the design variable set are the gains that we wanted to tune. So if you go over here, add new, and you'll see that there's already a bunch of them populated here. And I just need to select the gain I and the gain P. Click OK. Now from here, all you have to do is to press the optimize button. You will see a window popping up showing you the progress report. It listed how many optimization iterations had already been done. And you will notice that uh, um, during the first couple of iterations here, the IQ response is not convergent. It's out of bounds. Then the optimization tool is uh, tweaking the PI gains in order to make the response to settle into the envelope. Here you might take a minute or two, so I'm actually gonna cut some time. So after about 10 iterations, uh, the optimization converged, which means that uh, the step response settled into our preset envelope. Now, if you go back to the workspace in MATLAB, you will notice that uh, the gain values are already updated by the Simulink design optimization. And let's uh, simulate with that uh, gain. So we go back to the top level model, simulate again. Now you'll notice that the IQ current response is much better than before. Okay, now we have done tuning the gains for the PI controller. Next, I wanted to introduce you to the third topic, which is dynamic decoupling control. Actually, cross-coupling control has already been implemented in model one. If you go inside the controller model and go inside the current controller, we will notice that we have a controller module around here called dynamic decoupling control. So I want you to try one thing. Just go ahead and highlight these blocks around here and then select comment them out. You'll likely get a warning saying that you cannot comment out this input port, but that's fine. So after being commented out, this part won't play a role in the control system. Okay, now go back to the top level model and simulate it again. Now you will see that if you look at the response, it is not as good as before. Now let me explain what is cross decoupling control and why it has an impact on the controller performance. Let's look at the machine's voltage equation on the DQ axis. Let me zoom in a little bit. So ideally, 
we would like to have the d-axis current to be controlled by the d-axis voltage and also the q-axis current to be controlled by the q-axis voltage. But if you look at these two equations, you will see that VD, instead of just controlling ID, it will also have an impact on IQ. And also for VQ, instead of just controlling IQ, it will also have an impact on ID. This is called cross-coupling between D and Q axis. As you can see, this cross-coupling will become stronger as speed increases because speed is the coefficient here. So at higher speed, this cross-coupling turn will negatively affect the motor's dynamic performance. Therefore, the cross-coupling terms need to be taken care of in the control. So this part over here is the part that cancels out the cross-decoupling terms and therefore implementing decoupling control. What you are seeing here uh, in the model is actually a simplified version of dynamic decoupling control. And it doesn't really consider the variations of uh, motor parameters at different operating conditions. In industry, engineers will uh, use lookup tables instead of fixed parameters to calculate the dynamic decoupling terms. And also other types of decoupling control might be used as well. So from here, after uh, tuning the PI controllers and also taking care of the cross-coupling term, uh, we will move on to model two, which is basically an extension of model one. So this is model two. Before running model two, please remember to run the model two initialization. So in model two, we added a speed loop on top of the current control loop and we assigned ID equals zero all the time. Then we use uh, the output from the speed PI loop as the command for the IQ current. This is so-called ID equals zero control. This type of control strategy is not necessarily the best uh, control strategy for this type of PMS and machine. I uh, use this here just as an example to show you how to do speed closed loop control. So if you go back to the top level model and just press the simulation button, you can look in the scope and see the speed loop response. I see that the speed uh, follows the command pretty well. So here as an exercise, you can actually uh, try to use Simulink design optimization to tune uh, the PI controller gains for the speed loop. Now let's move on to topic four, flux weakening control. This is a very important topic for PMSM control. Electric and hyperelectric vehicles requires the PMSM motor to operate in a wide range of speed. But without flux weakening control and due to voltage limitations, PMSM machines cannot operate in the high speed region. Let's look at the torque speed map of a PMSM machine. This is a typical torque speed operation envelope for PMSM motors. There are basically two operating regions. One is the constant torque region, and the other one is the constant power region. Uh, there's possibly another region beyond uh, the constant power region. Depends on the characteristics of that particular machine, but we are going to ignore that uh, in this example. The corner point between the constant torque region and the constant power region corresponds to uh, the base speed of this PMSM motor. The base speed is primarily determined by the DC bus voltage of the inverter that drives this motor. In the example that I provided, uh, the base speed is about 876 RPM. When the machine operates above base speed, the inverter's DC bus voltage will be utilized to the maximum and therefore won't be able to drive enough currents into the machine to generate the required torque if the torque command continue to increase. We can look at this issue from the torque speed operating envelope. So all regions below the green envelope are regions physically possible for the PMSM to operate. For example, at 2500 RPM and a torque command of 180 Newton meter such as indicated by the star here. It is impossible for this motor to operate at this operating point simply because it's outside of the envelope. 
we can look at the operation envelope from another angle on the current IDIQ axis. This axis is what motor control engineers commonly use in industry to analyze motor operating points. So here, first, uh, ignore the red trajectories and focus on this light blue ellipse. This is the so-called speed limit contour or speed limit ellipse. The physical limitation of the inverter that's driving the motor requires that the motor always operate either on or inside this contour. So at 2500 RPM, this motor can only operate either on this contour or inside the contour. Notice that we have contours for the torque as well. Here this blue contour is 180 Nm and then the other one is 50 Nm. Apparently, here this 180 Nm torque contour does not have any intersection with the speed limit ellipse. Therefore, this particular torque command cannot be achieved when the motor operates at 2500 RPM. So under this circumstance, we will need to downgrade the torque command and use flux weakening control to find uh, the most appropriate operating points such that the losses in the machine can be minimized. To help you better understand flux weakening control, I'm going to use uh, this industry example to show you how to select flux weakening operating points. Basically, there are three cases I'd like to discuss. Case one, when the speed is below base speed. So let me repeat here. The first thing you have to keep in mind uh, when you are analyzing machine operating points on the IDIQ plane is that the voltage limit ellipse right here dictates uh, the operating region that's physically achievable. So anywhere on this part of the ellipse or inside the ellipse is achievable by the inverter. Here also let me explain the red trajectories, which consist of three parts. The first part is called MTPA, which stands for maximum torque per ampere, and the second part is the current limit, and then the third part is MTPV, which stands for maximum torque per volt. You can find their definitions in textbooks, and so I'm not going to spend more time here. In the first case, when the speed is below base speed, uh, we are actually not doing any flux weakening control in this case. Assume that uh, now we have two torque commands. One is 180 Nm and the other one is 50 Nm. They both intersect with the MTPA line. Under base speed, the intersections between the torque contour and the MTPA line are actually the most efficient operating points for that machine. So here point A and point B are actually the optimized operating points that we wanted to put in our lookup table. In the second case, speed is above base speed, let's say 1300 RPM. Remember our base speed for this machine is around 900 RPM. The speed limit ellipse shrinks as speed goes higher. And remember, only the points that are located either on or inside the speed limit contour can be achieved. In this case, you can see that the 180 Nm torque contour intersects this MTPA line outside the speed limit ellipse. And therefore, this point right here is not achievable. And in this case, we have to select point B as the optimal operating point, which is the intersection of the torque contour and the speed limit ellipse. Because this is the operating point that can achieve the required torque while generating minimum loss. As for the 15 Nm command, because point A is still inside the speed limit contour, and therefore we continue to use this point as the optimal operating point. In a third case, or a case 2B, this is where the speed is above base speed and we have a torque command that's not achievable. As you can see, here clearly the 180 Nm contour does not intersect with a speed limit ellipse. And in this case, we cannot achieve this torque. Still, we are going to put point B in the lookup table because point B is the intersection of the speed limit contour and uh, the MTPV line, which indicates the maximum torque that can be achieved under this speed limit. As for the 50 Nm torque contour, because it intersects the speed limit ellipse at point A, therefore this torque is achievable. 
In the end, when we look at all the torque commands and speed limit contours, this is what the final flux weakening lookup table points will look like. In industry, we will automate this lookup table calibration process by either scripting in MATLAB or use uh, toolboxes such as the model-based calibration toolbox. Now let's jump to model 3. This model demonstrates the implementation of the flux weakening control algorithm. So first let's uh, take a look at the initialization file. As you can see here, all the lookup table points for flux weakening control have been populated here. So let me run the initialization. And then from here, let's go to model 3 again and run model 3. So in model 3, instead of having a speed close loop on top of the current loop, it actually has a torque control loop. So let's look inside here. Uh, the inputs to this controller are the torque command and also the speed feedback that's coming from the motor. So the flux weakening control lookup tables will take uh, the torque command and the speed feedback and then generate the ID and IQ current command. You can actually look inside these lookup tables and uh, visualize the lookup table points. Just click Edit Table and Breakpoints, and then from here, click this. And then you'll see the lookup table surface. Now let's go back to the top level model and just run it. Check the results. So basically what you're seeing here is the torque control response. So we're giving the torque command and see how um, the actual torque follows the command. And in this case, in the beginning, the torque command is 100 Newton meter. And then at 1.5, um, 1.25 seconds, the torque command steps up to 200 Newton meter. And then if you check the speed, uh, the speed is actually controlled by uh, what we call the dyno uh, speed source. In this case, the speed ramps up from 0 RPM to 1500 RPM within one second. And as we know, 1500 RPM in this case is already in a flux weakening region. And then the speed maintains 1500 RPM for one second and then ramps down to uh, 0 RPM. As you can see, whether this machine is operating below base speed or above base speed, uh, the torque response is uh, always following the command. Now we are close to the end of this motor control with MATLAB and Simulink video. To summarize, we talked about FOC control, auto tuning PI controller, dynamic decoupling control, and flux weakening control. So the models that we walked through in this video are provided for you. Hopefully you can play with them and get familiar with these control topics if you have not already. And if you're interested in learning more about this topic, Search Motor and Power Control Design with Simulink. Here at this MathWorks page, you will find a lot of information. So that brings us to the end of this video. I hope you have learned something here and that you can apply what you have learned to your future work and projects. Thank you very much for watching.